Hello everyone, welcome to Narayana IS Academy. My name is Shubham Sagar and in today's daily news analysis we'll be taking five articles of Hindu and Indian Express combined. If we talk about the first article of the day, which is on Hindu page number seven, reforming the process of judicial appointment. So there are pendency of cases in different high courts and that is directly correlated to the judicial appointments or lack of it. So we have to talk about it and we'll try to understand the tussle between collegian system and the earlier introduced NJAC Act and whether reformed NJAC is the way forward. If we talk about the second article of the day which is on Indian Express page number 13, why Namibia plans to kill hundreds of its majestic wild animals for meat. So we'll try to understand the drought scenario which is therein. Namibia, what is happening there, how precarious is the situation and is this killing of a majestic animal, what is that majestic animal, we'll talk about it, very unusual, has it happened before in other parts of the world, we have to talk about these and more in this particular article. If we talk about the third article of the day, which is again on Indian Express page number 13, Rule 170 of Drugs Act and how it is related or is it related to Ayush Ministry, why Supreme Court has said certain things to Ayush Ministry, we'll try to understand this. If we talk about the fourth article of the day, which is on Hindu page number six, crisis in Vana that no one talks about. What is Vana? W-A-N-A. What is happening in Sunan? We'll try to correlate all these stuff plus the implications, the stakes for India in Vana and Sudan. We'll talk about these things in detail there. If we talk about the last article of the day, which is on Hindu page number eight, are lie detector tests legally valid? We'll try to understand about polygraph test what Supreme Court or what different judgments are there on polygraph test, different fundamental rights related to lie detector or polygraph test, their correlation, the lie detector test correlation with the Kolkata tragedy. All these things will be discussed in this last article. Once we are done with these five articles, we'll solve five prelims practice questions and one means practice question. Because as we have discussed earlier, practice makes a man as well as a woman perfect. So let's get started. If you talk about the first article of the day, reforming the process of judicial appointments. So here we'll be talking about collegium system or collegium system rather, NJAC, National Judicial Appointments Commission. What was 99th Constitutional Amendment Act? Why was it struck down? All these are important terms. All these things we should be knowing about it. We should be knowing about the whole issue. Second ARC has commented upon Indian judiciary. How Indian judiciary is one of the rarest example in the world of a judiciary which is appointing itself. So there are certain issues, there are certain opaqueness. So we have to talk about this. We have to talk about how like independence of judiciary is important, but at the same time, transparency and accountability are also important when it comes to Indian judiciary. Question related to NJAC, which we'll be talking about in just few moments from now has been asked by UPSC earlier. So what is the context? 60 lakh cases are pending in various high courts. More than crore cases are pending if you include high court, supreme court and subordinate courts. And here the author is saying that 30% of judicial seats are vacant when it comes to high court and that has a direct correlation with the pending cases which are there. The appointment of judges is linked to case pendency and it's a very contentious issue in India. Why is it contentious? We'll understand this. So collegian system versus NJAC. This collegian system is a system by which judges are appointed in High Court as well as Supreme Court. So you have Chief Justice of India and four Supreme Court judges. They will be appointing or transferring judges of Supreme Court. When it comes to appointment of judges of High Court or transfer of judges of High Court, Chief Justice of India and two judges of Supreme Court. That is the basic funda. But the point here is all these people, they are part of judiciary itself. In a way, judiciary is appointing itself. There are no other representation from executive or from other classes and that is one of the major criticism of collegian system. It evolved from three judges case, it did not come from constitution on its own. So let's try to understand this. Delay in judicial appointments often result from conflicts between judiciary and executive. So generally what happens, let's say we have talked about Chief Justice of India and four senior most judges of Supreme Court. They will be sending recommendation to government and government has to accept it. Let's say government sent it back or they did not act on it. That will lead to too much delay. But if government sent it back and the collegium again sends it, then government is in a limbo. They have to accept the name. So all these things are happening. Sometimes government will not take any action. That will lead to too much delay. That will lead to increase in pendency of cases. Everything is correlated. The Supreme Court struck down the NGAC Act. So National Judicial Appointments Commission was a attempt by executive where they have brought together different people. Six people were there. The committee, the proposed committee will talk about it from different strata 
and then supreme court struck it down because they said that it will impact the transparency or the independence of judiciary more like per se like not the transparency part but the independence would be curtailed of judiciary to a greater extent when you we have people from other arena appointing members of judiciary so the court argued that collegian system protects judicial independence despite global norms where the judiciary doesn't solely appoint judges and that's why second day as he said that india is one of the rarest country or one of the few country in the world if not the only country where judiciary appoints itself and that has to change and that's what this particular article is talking about so collegian system is a current method used in india for the appointment and transfer do remember this not only appointment even transfer of judges to higher judiciary including sc and hcs supreme court and high courts so composition collegium composed of chief justice of india and four senior most judges of supreme court for appointments to supreme court and when we talk about high court then collegium includes cji and two senior most supreme court judges the supreme court introduced the system again we have discussed this this whole process of appointment and transfer of judges is not given in the constitution it came from three judges case first case was there in 1981 1993 and 1998 via which judicial primacy was adopted in a way judiciary trusted upon executive that whatever names we are suggesting more or less you have to accept it judicial primacy because then only independence of judiciary will be there so system was established to safeguard the independence of judiciary by minimizing executive influence in judicial appointments about ngac act because india is one of the rarest country according to second arc where judiciary is appointing itself that because of this executive felt like there was a need for an act and ngac act came into existence so national judicial appointments commission act was an attempt to reform the process of appointing judges to the higher judiciary by replacing the collegian system here if we see this we'll see six members and we'll see they are from different strata so the purpose was and this was 99 constitutional amendment act they can directly ask you 99 constitutional amendment act is associated with which of the following right it was aimed at establishing a commission responsible for appointment and transfer of judges do remember this part also most of the people remember appointment but transfer is an integral component of it it was intended to address criticism of the collegian system now this ngac was supposed to have six members why supposed because it has been struck down so chief justice of india one then two senior most judges of supreme court 1 plus 2 3 then you have union minister of law and justice who is a part of executive so that is four right then two eminent persons who can be and they will be selected by a committee of cgi P, prime minister and lop so we can see different strata are involved when it comes to appointment in judiciary in ngac national judicial appointments commission and in october 2015 supreme court said that no we are striking down ngac act we are striking down this 99 constitutional amendment act because it is unconstitutional it is violating the basic structure of the constitution that independence of judiciary is sacrosanct or sacrosanct whatever phonetics you follow and we have to and we cannot play with the concept of independence of judiciary it is of utmost important it is a part of basic structure of the constitution again which has been framed by supreme court itself in keshwanand bharti case so global example what is happening in other parts of the world when it comes to judicial appointments many countries have adopted commission based system uk south africa france and the system what they have they have mix of judicial governmental and civil society representative just like what we have seen in ngac so that's why this author of this particular article will advocate for you can reform ngac but we need some form of ngac where other people are also involved apart from judiciary these models provide a more balanced and transparent approach to judicial appointments which india could learn from so reworking the ngac and conclusion ngac was a well intended reform that could have accelerated judicial appointments through its democratic structure and the current collegian system is opaque judiciary appointing judiciary karthik calling karthik and susceptible to favoritism which may hinder the appointment of deserving judges so again there has to be some amount of accountability and transparency what this author is talking about a reworked ngac could strike a balance between judicial independence and accountability involving input from judiciary executive and civil society so even if not six members five members members from other strata whatever if you want to reform ngac do it but bring it back that's what this author is talking about a revised ngac could improve the efficiency of judicial appointments and reduce case pendency while maintaining public confidence in the judiciary if you talk about the second article of the day why namibia plans to kill hundreds of its majestic wild animals for meat 
So they are planning to kill many animals, including elephants and other animals, which we'll talk about. And if we talk about, like, if we take it from Indian perspective, we'll be like, oh my God, they will be killing elephants. Now here we have to see the African perspective, whether it is allowed or not. What caused Nam Namibia to take such drastic steps? What is happening in Namibia? What is the reason for such an occurrence? Let's say drought is happening in Namibia. A drought which has not been seen in the last hundred years. What is the reason for such drought? Is it happening because of El Nino or La Nina? All these things are the points which we have to ponder about when we are reading this particular article. So previous a question related to like here El Nino, you will be seeing an association of this article with El Nino. And questions related to El Nino has been asked, have been asked rather in prelims as well as means. So what is the context? Namibia plans to cull 723 wild animals. Now question for you. And I will keep on saying it. Now I'm seeing participation from people who are posting their marks, etc. So in the end, we'll be having five prelims practice question. Whatever questions you're getting correct, you have to post it in the comment section. Also, there's a question for you. So in India, we have something called as WPA 1972, Wildlife Protection Act 1972. First of all, one question for you. How many schedules are there in WPA 1972? And which particular schedule of 1972 allows culling of animals? Killing of animals. Because... This WPA 1972 question has been asked by UPSC earlier. So Namibia is killing 723 wild animals who are planning to kill, including elephant, hippos, hippopotamus, buffaloes, zebras, to provide meat for its population. Why? Because there is a drought in the country. Drought which was like a drought which has not been seen in the last hundred years. Such kind of drought. People are dying of hunger. So that's why they are killing these animals. And that is not the only reason. We'll t see different other reasons also, which are involved here. The kill list, and they have already started killing. Over 150 animals have already been killed. The kill list includes 30 hippopotamus, 60 buffaloes, 50 impalas. Again, you can see zebras, elephants, elands. Now, there's another question for you. Hippopotamus and elephant. What are their IUCN status? If you know it, you can post it in the comment section. Also, important from exam perspective is Namibia here. Where is it located? Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, Northern Africa. What are the neighboring countries of Namibia? All these points are important from exam perspective. Places in news, PIN. More about the news. Government justification. What government is saying? Why they are killing these animals? Some of which are in the IUC and vulnerable etc. list, right? So Namibia's Ministry of Environment, Forest and Forestry and Tourism, they justify the culling. Why? They say that it is necessary. Because we have to use these natural resources for the benefits of its citizen, aligning, aligning with con country's constitutional mandate. Is it legally allowed? Is it allowed in African continent? That is the question to ponder upon, which we will see. We will see the answer. We will know the answer of this question in just a few moments from now. So, drought has happened. Why it has happened? Because of El Nino. El Nino causes drought in our country also. So, and it's a phenomena which is still being studied. We try to understand what is this UNSO, El Nino, Southern Oscillation, what is happening in Pacific Ocean, alternate cooling, warming, all these things. People are, or meteorologists are still studying it, but El Nino, more or less, it has been seen. It caused drought in our country, India also, and it, it is causing drought in Namibia in this scenario as well. Impact of climate change. Rising global temperature due to climate change have increased the frequency and intensity of such extreme weather events like dro droughts, worsening the situation in Namibia. And a dross effect on Namibia. Devastated crops, killed livestock, depleted 84% of Namibia's food reserve. This is actually a very huge number. Led to high food prices, acute food insecurity for 1.2 million people. 12 lakh people are suffering from food insecurity. And Namibia is not a big country like India. So 12 lakh means a lot there. And again, find out what is the total population of Namibia and 12 lakh people comprises what percentage? This is 84% of food reserve. This is not 84% of population. So 12 lakh people comprises what percentage of Namibia's total population? Increased malnutrition. So all these things are happening, which has necessitated the need for such drastic measure. Now, women are also vulnerable to this. And this, this is an example of drought also. We can use these examples in our cases also. When we are reading disaster management in GS paper 3 and when we are talking about NDMA guidelines related to drought, we can also talk about how drought impacts Indian women. Because these kind of issues are very similar. The drought has increased the vulnerability of women, exposing them to higher risk of gender-based violence because they travel, even in our country, in states like Rajasthan, girls travel longer, longer distance for food and water. So these kind of things will happen in our country also if the intensity of drought increases. Purpose of culling and conclusion. So beyond providing meat, that is not the only reason. 
the culling aims to prevent because let's say you have wild animals they will drink water they will also search for food they don't have food they're suffering from drought so there are multiple reason for killing such animals so killing is done to prevent wild animals from migrating in search of food and water because food absolutely not there 84% food resources have been impacted which could lead to human wildlife conflict it also helps manage grazing pressure and water availability in drought stricken areas so culling wild animals now what is the status whether it is allowed it is not unusual it happens in africa where species like zebras blue wild beast and impala are commonly eaten so again this is not unusual this has happened earlier in the past but the magnitude and intensity this time is much bigger the practice if done sustainably is considered acceptable by international standards but even then people countries are talking about this precarious situation in namibia if we talk about the third article of the day rule 170 of drugs act so here we'll try to establish a correlation between rule 170 of drugs and cosmetics act ayush ministry and supreme court why supreme court is saying something to ayush ministry over rule 170 of drugs and cosmetics act that's what this news is all about so question related to fixed dose drug combinations all these things have been asked so drugs and cosmetic act becomes important cosmetics act so what is the context here supreme court recently criticized the ministry of ayush now ayush is ayurveda yoga and naturopathy sometimes the people don't include naturopathy yunani siddha and homeopathy you will include based on ush but you will forget naturopathy it is naturopathy means is also there along with yoga regarding the enforcement of rule 170 now let's understand this so rule 170 was originally not there in drugs and cosmetics act it was introduced in 2018 why to put a tab on the ads related to ayush products so rule 170 of drugs and cosmetics act keep a tab on the ads related to ayush product but recently ayush ministry has said that whatever restrictions were being applied by rule 170 that can be negated or that can be neglected now supreme court is not liking that supreme court is saying that when you are neglecting rule 170 in in a way you are undermining the whole restrictions or a tab which was there earlier on ayush products and you are giving them a free pass which is not acceptable which should not be done right so what is rule 170 of drugs and cosmetics act rule 170 of drugs and cosmetics act was introduced in 2018 it was originally not there in this particular act to regulate the advertising of ayush products what is the goal of this particular rule 170 to prevent misleading ads like uh, uh, there were certain political experts who were saying that baba ramdev's patanjali it said certain things which were not exactly true so such kind of things shouldn't be happening again so to prevent misleading ads that could deceive consumers about the efficacy and safety of these products under rule 170 ayush drug manufacturers are required to obtain prior approval from state licensing authority before they can advertise their products so there are certain restrictions there are certain criteria which these ayush drug manufacturers they have to implement or they have to do right and these approvals involve the allocation of unique identification number and then there are other things textual references indication for use just so that they are not advertising misleading things right so that is a major purpose of rule 170 of drugs and cosmetics act the rule 170 also set criteria for rejecting advertisement these include failure to provide manufacturer contact details and again obscene vulgar content promotion of products hope you are understanding it it is trying to prevent misleading advertisement okay users of celebrity or government officials endorsement false or exaggerated claims about the product's efficiency or efficacy these stringent measures were introduced following concerns raised by a parliamentary standing committee regarding the proliferation of misleading claims in ayush drug advertisement and this should not happen so why is supreme court intervening now why they are criticizing the ayush ministry because they want or this particular ministry is trying to undermine according to supreme court they are trying to undermine this rule 170 and the supreme court criticized the ayush ministry for its july 1 2024 notification that directed state counseling or licensing authorities rather to ignore rule 170 of the drugs and cosmetics act this move was seen as an attempt to bypass the rule potentially allowing misleading advertisement of ayush products to go unchecked that's what we are continuously talking about the court expressed concern that this directive weakened the regulatory framework meant to protect consumers from false claim about the efficacy of ayush products Rule 170 was specifically established to prevent such deceptive practices and by bringing such a notification 
Ayush ministry is trying to undermine the whole prevention of such deceptive practices. And the ministry action was viewed as harmful to public health. And that's why Supreme Court has criticized the Ayush ministry. Hope you understood the linkage between Rule 170 of Drugs and Cosmetics Act, Ayush ministry and Supreme Court. If you talk about the fourth article of the day, a crisis in Vana that no one talks about. Vana, West Asia and North Africa. So when you talk about West Asia, we think about Gaza, we think about Israel. But something is happening in Sudan as well. Nobody talks about that. And this article is talking about that particular thing which nobody is talking about. So when we talk about Vana, Vana is a region which does not have a fixed point that these are the countries which are in West Asia and North Africa. Sudan is more often than not included in Vana. Sometimes it is also not included in Vana. So don't be like rigid about this. But yes, Sudan is in that region and nobody is talking about Sudan. Everybody is talking about Gaza and Israel as well as Palestine. Questions related to this region, this West Asia region, especially West Asia region, more than North Africa, is a hot favorite of UPSC. Questions have been asked. Areas which are bordering Mediterranean Sea, especially in the West Asian region. So, what is the context? The topic highlights the severe humanitarian crisis in Sudan. So, you, Yemen earlier has been asked, South Sudan has been asked. So, we should be ready about these. Again, places in news. Namibia, we have talked about today. Why? Why this particular human humanitarian crisis is happening in Sudan? Because there is a fight between two forces. One is a Sudan armed forces, which is the official armed forces of Sudan. And then rapid support forces, which is a paramilitary force. So earlier it was supported by the government. Now, later on, they became a rebellion or rebellious kind of a group. And now it is not considered a part of the Sudanese forces. And again, there are different, different countries. Some countries like UK, etc., they're supporting RSF. Some other countries are supporting Sudan armed forces. So it has become a political battle. It has become a battle of alliances as well. So the crisis has resulted in a massive loss of life, widespread displacement and impending famine and disease. Already Namibia is suffering from drought. Africa is always in one turmoil or the other, African countries. Despite its severity, the crisis in Sudan is underreported compared to other conflicts in Wana, West Asia, North Africa region such as Gaza. So this is Sudan. Pay attention, sometimes they will ask you, which of the following countries border Red Sea? In that scenario, you have to pay attention here. Sudan does border Red Sea, right? So now Sudan. Sudan is the third largest country in Africa. Again, a question for you. If you know it, which is the largest country in Africa and which is the second largest country in Africa, if you know it, post it in the comment section. History marked by civil wars, military coups, land borders with seven countries, coastline along the Red Sea. Even if you forget the seven countries, although you should be keeping a tab on the seven countries because this is places in news and this country is in news actually. But Red Sea is very important. It does border Red Sea. Gained independence in 1956, but autocratic regime, despotic regime was there. Ethnically diverse with a significant Arab and non-Arab population. Okay. Economically, they are agrarian, just like India is agrarian. 50%, around 50% population is engaged in agriculture. They are also agrarian, but they are they are much poorer than us. Okay. The crisis began with a power struggle between SAF and like, you can forget the names of these generals. Just remember, one forces, which is like the armed forces of Sudan, the other forces, which is a paramilitary force, which is now not recognized as armed forces of Sudan. Escalated into full-scale war in April 2023, causing widespread violence, the capital. And why has this happened? These two forces are fighting. Because different countries of the world, they are supporting one group or the other. And you can understand what is happening. Like earlier also, we have read how UK used to invest a lot in Egypt. or So there are different political alliances, new colonialism. Like even though they are not controlling the country directly, they are controlling via finances, via economy. So these kind of political tussles, international power tussle is going on in vulnerable countries like Sudan. So capital Khartoum and much of Sudan have been devastated with no resolution in sight. So Nawana, West Asia, North Africa, geopolitically significant. Now see this. So this is a Wana region, but sometimes Sudan in some, uh, what do you say, maps or some descriptions, it is included in the Wana region. But sometimes it is also not included in the Wana region. But more often than not, it is a part of Wana. So West Asia, North Africa region, geopolitically, there is no fixed definition of Wana. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So due to its energy resources, strategic location and history of conflicts and that you can also understand it. Where will you say the west part ends and the north part begins? All these are very like somewhat relative, right? So that's why there is little bit of discrepancy when it talks when we talk about 
what are wana countries different interpretation so region has diverse ethnic and religious groups with its frequent conflicts revolutions and wars these people these colonial powers when they divided africa they divided it in such a way that one part of one tribe is in one country other portion is in another country so all these things have led to the creation of different factions fightings wars and that is going on sudan though on the periphery is connected to wana's broader geopolitical dynamics involving various regional and global powers so west asia north africa foreign players involvement we are talking about why this has escalated into such a big issue because the groups are forming rsf backed by russia and uae and saf they are backed by egypt and iran so different groups are there who are supporting different factions and that's why this whole thing is escalating and is escalating very fast and we need to keep a closer tab on it just like we are keeping a closer tab on gaza foreign involvement complicates conflict resolution and exacerbates the humanitarian crisis indian stakes we are we have like a bilateral trade exceeding 2 billion dollars so we have a lot invested in sudan and major indian investment is is in there in sudan's oil sector extended lines of credit are there so and strong people to people ties are there sudani students come to india especially delhi you will see them there medical tourists so all these things are there people to people soft power hard power everything is involved and we need, again india also needs to keep a close tab on whatever is happening in sudan ongoing conflict threatens investment trade relation and raises concern about the resurgence of islamic military impacting india security just like different political arena different channels they are covering gaza same way even if not that much interest some amount of interest should also be shown in what is happening in sudan if you if you want this particular situation to not escalate further so what is the way forward india should support international and regional efforts to broker a ceasefire in sudan and encourage dialogue between the conflicting parties increasing humanitarian assistance is crucial to address the urgent needs and maintaining diplomatic ties will help safeguard we need to keep a closer tab on what is happening in sudan because our financial our economic and our people to people ties will be impacted to a greater degree if we talk about the last article of the day our lie detector test legally valid so here we'll talk about lie detector test and we do know why this lie detector test is in news because of kolkata rape murder tragedy what is the difference between lie detector test test rather which is polygraph test and narco test they are not the same which fundamental rights are there which are involved with these tests and which are being violated also what are different supreme court judgments what are different nhrc guidelines related to lie detector test whether they can be taken as evidence or not all these questions and points we have to ponder upon when we are reading this article question related to again fundamental rights are involved here in this particular article and that's why we have included a question questions on fundamental rights has been asked by upsc in prelims as well as mains so the article discusses the legal validity and implications of using lie detector test such as polygraphs in criminal investigations in india and here we'll be talking about cbi recently conducted a second round of polygraph test on seven individuals whether when we are doing all these lie detector tests should we take the consent of the individuals involved or not if they are not taking the consent of the individuals involved article 20 is getting violated how will we understanding this so cbi obtained permission from a kolkata court to administer these tests raising questions about legal status and ethical implications so here we will be understanding polygraph test narco test test rather which is more reliable which can give you more accurate data so all these things are important sometimes people feel like polygraph test and narco test they are all the same but they are not the same so polygraph test commonly known as lie detector test it will see like there will be certain parameters they'll be checking and if they are seeing abnormality in those data which are there in the form of numbers they'll be feeling like okay you are lying that is a basic summary of how polygraph test work but that is not how narco test work in narco test something will be injected in your body some substances will be there which some people believe take you to a trance state where you are incapable of lying so polygraph test narco test they are not the same so again here in polygraph test lie detector test they'll be checking your blood pressure breathing rate skin conductivity all these things will be changed drastically or will be changing drastically when you are lying 
test is based on the belief that these physiological responses differ when a person is lying compared to when they are telling the truth. By assigning numerical values to these responses, you must have seen it in YouTube videos also, also of different celebrities. There are certain lines which will go up and down and then they will be telling, you are telling the truth, you are telling a lie. So that is a polygraph test. So the concept of polygraph dates back to 19th century related to Italy and Italian criminologist Cesare Lombroso. He used a machine to detect changes and from there, this whole polygraph test evolved. So now what is a polygraph test? It is different from a narco test and it is not 100% accurate. Many people believe, again there are discrepancies here, but many people believe that narco test is more accurate as compared to a polygraph test. A narco analysis involves injecting sodium pentothal into the accused including a hypnotic or sedated state. So that's why we are saying that in that trance state you are incapable of lying and that's why it is believed that narco is more reliable and trustworthy and accurate than polygraph test. In this state, individual is considered incapable of lying and is expected to re reveal rather truthful information. So how, how is polygraph test conducted? So here, there will be a single strip of moving paper, graph. Again, you can watch so many videos which are there of various celebrities and that will be showing uh, blood pressure, pulses, perspiration. And if there is abnormal movement, then faster heart rate, higher blood pressure, increased sweating, all these indicate that the person is lying. This kind of video, you may have seen it a lot on YouTube. So now, legality of polygraph test. Whether it is legal or not, whether you should take the consent of the accused or not, people involved, whether you should be taking their consent or not. Article 20, Clause 3. No person accused of any offence shall be compelled to be a witness against themselves. So when you are conducting a lie detector on a particular person, is he becoming a witness of himself or against himself? So in that scenario, you do need to take the consent. As per this provision, polygraph test against the will or consent, please understand this, of the accused would be an infringement of Article 20, Clause 3 of the Indian Constitution. So if a polygraph test is being conducted, consent of that particular person involved should be taken. So obtaining consent from the accused before conducting such test is necessary. Otherwise, you will be violating Article 20, Clause 3. Otherwise, it may lead to violation of person's right against self-incrimination or right to remain silent. The courts usually criticize polygraph tests because sometimes and most of the times they believe that consent was not taken and it is an example or it is a type of mental torture which violates right to life under Article 21 as well. So Article 20, Clause 3, Article 21, these are two very important fundamental rights associated with legality of polygraph test. Generally, polygraph tests are taken in rare cases when we are talking about national security, etc. And in this scenario, again, people are debating whether polygraph test was needed or tests were needed or not. NHRC guidelines are there. Again, here they are saying consent is needed. Person should be informed. Consent given by the subject must be recorded. All these things, again, based on like if like in this scenario, if these things are done, it will not violate Article 20, Clause 3. It will not violate Article 21. Judicial pron pronouncement, if you see these cases, Selvi versus State of Karnataka, DK versus versus State of Bengal, same thing has been reiterated that polygraph test, narco analysis without consent violates an individual's mental privacy and fundamental right. Supreme Court here also in the DK Basu case said that administration of polygraph and narco involuntary administration is test amounts to cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment violating right to life and liberty under Article 21. So we have done five articles, now it's time for solving five prelims practice question and one means practice question. And I will keep on reiterating it that once these five questions are done, please post your marks in the comment section. Also answer those questions which I have asked earlier. So without wasting any time, first question in front of you. Sudan, currently in the news due to an ongoing humanitarian crisis is located in which of the following regions? So again, this is a question which you can get wrong, but out of the options, which whatever options there is, the most suitable option is C, North Africa. Sudan is generally believed to be a part of North Africa, although it is very close to Horn of Africa. Second question, what is the primary purpose of Rule 170 of the Drugs and Cosmetics Act? We have had a detailed discussion on this, a relationship between Rule 170, Ayush Ministry and Supreme Court, and the purpose is to prevent misleading advertisement. I think you, most of you would have got this question correct. First question, whether that was correct or not, you can post it separately that, yeah, my first question was also correct. I have ticked like Northern Africa rather than Horn of Africa. Third question, under Rule 70 again, Drugs and Cosmetics Act, what must Ayush drug manufacturers secure before advertising their product? What is the answer here? 
prior approval from the state licensing authority which includes obtaining a unique identification number and other things like, like the documentation of product safety effectiveness and use so the answer is c just like the last uh dna where most of the answers were b hill answers are c so what about this question is the answer c here as well what do you think which article article of the constitution of india safeguards one's right not to be compelled to be a witness against himself the answer is article 20 again the answer is c so all the questions does they have an answer c let's see question number five consider the following statement regarding the recent culling of wild animals in namibia namibia's culling of wild animal is in response to the worst drought culling animals solely to uh, uh, aim solely to reduce human wildlife conflict in the drought affected areas the ongoing drought in namibia has been linked to the la nina phenomena and climate change so what do you think is the answer the answer is a one only culling is not solely other reasons are also there we have discussed about this ongoing drought is not because of la nina it is because of al nino so the answer is a one only again not all answers are c so how many you are getting correct out of like five do post it in the comment section means practice question related to if you see this particular question it is related to challenges associated with judicial appointment process so here you can talk about collegian system here you can talk about njac how second arc is saying that india is the only country in the world where judiciary appoints itself so transparency is getting like is missing somewhere we need transparency independence of judiciary is important but we need transparency all these things you have to talk about in this particular case so challenge of this collegian system lack of transparency judges appointing judges uh, cji plus four senior most judges cji plus two senior most judges so all these things vacancies are there case pendency are there judiciary executive conflict judiciary sometimes sits on the recommended names because they cannot do anything more about it so njac act is the solution how we need participation from other sectors as well judiciary executive and other sectors we can have a discussion on it but transparency and accountability as far as judiciary is concerned is need of the art although we will respect the concept of independence of judiciary global examples comparative models mixed system which is being followed in different countries of the world again which is saying that we need to rework on njac national judicial appointments commission and then you can conclude that a debate over collegian system and njac reflects broader concerns about the efficiency and then you can talk about we need a balance between independence and accountability so independence of judiciary has to be there but at the same time accountability and transparency is need of the hour and that is also there in our gs paper too transparency and accountability is explicitly mentioned in the syllabus right so yeah that's it for today's dna if you like the video do like share and subscribe and please post your marks in the comment section how many questions out of five you got correct take care be blessed see you soon